So in this discussion, I wanted to give one or two. I want to give two examples of linear circuits. In particular, I want to give examples of linear circuits that you may, that you're going to see a lot. But the other point of this is to just kind of talk through how do you analyze these circuits at a very basic level, and just kind of work your way through it. We're going to talk about over all sorts of different analysis and approaches, but this will just kind of give you a simple approach. So these are two circuits, one of which we use a lot, which is a resistive voltage divider, because often we want to take a particular voltage and divide it down by a fixed amount. And the second is, and this is basically a simple circuit, which is two resistors. And you'll see this used, the concept again and again and again, and, and seeing the intuition will help. The second thing is we're going to talk about a first order low pass filter that's effectively done with, it's a simple circuit with just a resistor and a capacitor sort of hooked up in one simple configuration. So I want to talk about both of these and just kind of work our way through these various conversations. So starting first with a resistive voltage divider. The circuit would look something like this. We would draw it with a voltage source and two voltage and two resistors here and here. And the question would be is how would I solve this circuit? How do I solve it? Well, you go through a couple things. We know we have both Kirchhoff's current law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and we also have the, we also have the current voltage relationships for the resistors. So we're going to use different aspects of this and all these as in different points. The first one to notice in this circuit is that I only have one current in this loop. There's only one. That current we'll call I. There's only one. Uh, there's nowhere else for the current to go. It can't like go running out the nodes. It's just there. So the next thing to notice, Kirchhoff's voltage law says, well, the sum of the voltages V in, V1, and V2 <coughs> would all have to equal zero. Well, we'll notice this is in one polarity. These are in opposite polarities. So I can say that the input voltage is equal to the sum of V1 and V out. We can simply write that at that expression there. Okay. So it begins to start to do that. The other thing we have to work with is we have that the current in this resistor is going to be the voltage over resistance. Remember, voltage is current times resistance. And in this one, it will be the voltage, which I'm calling V out. Um, and it's going to be that over R2. Now, I'll often try to define things in terms of an input and output because a lot of times you're using circuits to actually take a particular input signal and actually compute an output from it. So you'll see this being a very common notation and a common way that we'll approach this. <coughs> so it could have been V2, but I chose V out uh, just to make this interesting. And so that current is the same for both. So notice I have a proportionality here. So I can say that V1, which shows up here, could just be R1 over R2 times V out. Substituting in, I get a relationship between V in and V out. And doing a little bit of algebra, I find that V out is equal to V in times R2 over the sum of the two resistors. So this gives me an ability between those resistors to think about what would I see. So the very common circuit, and this is something that you will probably remember pretty quickly because the intuition of knowing this will help a lot of other circuits. You'll also see this circuit drawn in a different way, and I want to begin to bring this out right from the beginning. The first thing is we'll see that we'll often have a common node right here, and we'll often just say, well, why don't I just call that common node zero, or I'll call it ground, just to make it easy, and then everything is relative to that node. By the way, that is the same thing that we mean in ground when you look at like in a typical um, outlet in your house and there's a lower pin that says, you know, there's two active pins and a ground. It's that ground. Um, and so we usually like to have something that we can refer to and that's a way that we typically build circuits. So in that case, this structure might look something like this where I would actually say I'm applying an input voltage which I would be implicitly thinking it's a voltage source just like I drew. And then I'd also list, list this node as ground, so ground, okay. And then I would put the two resistors here, and I would maybe identify a voltage V out. By identifying, it does not mean anything's coming out of there. I assume nothing else is touching it. I'm just identifying it. In which case, if I did that, I would have exactly the same analysis and get exactly the same result. <laughs> so this gives me a this gives me a resistive voltage divider. And it's kind of a way to think of these circuits. Now, I want you to think about something because um, this is something that I will cover 
you know, in any class I would teach, uh, particularly linear circuits or otherwise, is asking a question, what happens if I were to use two capacitors to make a divider? This is a really interesting question because you're kind of going to start from charge and you're kind of going to start from current. And there's a couple ways to do this solution. And you can do it by identifying charge. You can do it by identifying the currents. All of it works. But there's some very interesting properties that you have to be aware of. Um, and so it's, a, it's going to give you a result that looks very, very similar, but it's a little bit different. And that difference is going to be due to there's going to be some charge stored here. Okay. So this is something I something that you know this is something you should be looking at and going through carefully and expecting that it's going to come up. The second thing is then talking about what happens as a resistor and capacitor. It's kind of a different form of this voltage divider, but now it's using a capacitive element in in, in place. And so I can do the same thing for analyzing it, that the sum of the voltages is still the same, so KCL is still true. There's only one effective current running through the loop, and that current means that the current that would be V over R, V1 over R, is in the current that's going through here, which is then C times the derivative of V out over DT. So again, I can just kind of work my way through this analysis very simply. You can start to generalize this for more complex circuits, but this is where this is where you start. And looking at that, I can then substitute for V1 into this, and I'll notice that that the main there's a two terms here, the R and the resistance capacitance multiply together. So I'm just going to call that by a single value, and I'm going to call that tau because I know it's going to have units of time. Uh, that multiplication of R and C we'll often talk about as a time constant because it'll be very relevant to a differential equation of this form. So I'm going to take this tau equals RC, I'm going to find it because I know they're together, I might as well make my math easier. Always important to get your math in as low entropy a form as you can get away with that has meaning. And this is really important to make sure that you know you can see the intuition from the mathematics that, that you're deriving. Just deriving math for the sake of math rarely turns out to be exactly what you want, and it usually means you can't do design. So then you'd say, well, this is how it says V1. As a result, I get this is my differential equation where tau is RC of the output voltage as a function of input voltage. This is a first order differential equation. We'll spend more time in other lectures talking about these systems, but it is. A, but you would expect to get an exponential um, decrease that's related to that time constant. Uh, if you've seen differential equations, you, you would know how to solve this. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll take a look at what does this mean in terms of overall dynamics and behavior, but this is the way you set up the problem, and you would expect that the time dynamics are actually going to be very interesting depending on what your initial condition is and other, other factors. So these two circuits hopefully give you a rough idea how you start doing analysis of circuits and how you put them together. These are two circuits I would definitely say are important. I would say make sure you understand them um, and just be very much ready to recognize and go, oh, these are the dynamics and the principles we're going to see.